speaking with State Senator Darren Soto of the 14th District in Florida. And Darren, if you would, would you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm 35 years old. I was born in Ringwood, New Jersey to a middle class family. And uh, growing up, I uh, played sports and liked the arts a lot. And uh, the only major area, always got decent grades, but the only area I really excelled in was in uh, history. Um, I was fascinated by history all throughout and ran for student body president, didn't win that, but uh, in Boy State I was uh, president of the Senate and that was my first little taste into, uh, into politics. And then I was turned off by it for a while, uh, going through Rutgers. Uh, I'd always vote and I even went to law school at GW over in our nation's capital and I uh, I didn't really find an interest in politics and what I do till I came down here after I took the bar. And that was really by joining the Young Democrats to meet people. And when I started volunteering on campaigns, it wasn't the, the cockiness that I saw in D.C. or even the staffers thought they were better than everybody. It was more walking door to door, learning about people's issues, and uh, learning how to help them. And that's when... I would volunteer, then I started managing campaigns, and the next thing I knew I was running for office in a, a special election and found myself in the Florida House as the second youngest member back in 2007. And uh, now, 2012, I won a Senate seat, uh, and I'm the second youngest member in that body now as well. So it's okay. been an interesting That's quite the interesting background. It sounds to me like your interest in politics was perhaps motivated by factors that don't usually motivate politicians. Uh, my conception of a politician is somebody that wants a lot of power and a lot of influence, but that doesn't sound like you. Well, I'd say first, I always, even when I was young, uh, liked people. Uh, I always wanted to be liked by folks. I always was friendly. And so there's definitely a, le a love of people. And also, there's no doubt about it, I do like attention. I always did when I was little. I do now. I mean, even today, I certainly enjoy uh, being able to talk about different things. Uh, but one of the things that is a big motivation for me is getting the positive feedback when you actually help someone. And when you're walking door to door, and when you're talking to thousands of people, and you actually get to do something, uh, and you see a life changed, uh, it's very gratifying. And one of the other major motivations that I have is it goes back to the fact that I've always been a fan of history and I always wanted to make a mark in life. I always wanted to leave the world better than when I had it and uh, when I leave this earth to have a legacy. And I didn't realize that until I got older how important that was to me as well as to have a legacy of, of shaping the world for the better and having people remember me. How would you like people to describe you uh, posthumously? What would, what would you like to see? Uh, I'm <laughs> fair, open-minded, humble, uh, able to bring disparate sections of society together, kind of a collaborator mm -hmm. and a reconciler. Do you, can you think of a particular event in your life that may have been the catalyst for that type of approach? Uh, well, I think growing up, I went through various phases where I'd have a lot of friends or I didn't, and uh, there was a lot of times where I found myself early on in life trying to get noticed, notice me, you know, we would throw parties and, and uh, I would make a lot of jokes growing up and I realized later on uh, when I got mature enough to realize that I didn't need a lot of those folks was uh, I, d I had already developed a lot of skills on how to be likable and uh, but I also honed a lot of skills through college through being in a fraternity where we had to um, throw events and I was rush chair and I'd bring kids in and I'd pat them on the back and tell them that you know this would be a great place and so mm -hmm. there's definitely that aspect where uh, where I and my dad is also a pretty affable guy too and my great uncle who was in politics also I remember him when I was growing up he was a, a district attorney and a school board member in Yonkers New York and he helped found Pearl Def and actually was uh, the head attorney for the Division of Highways and in the federal government because he was involved with President Carter winning the Puerto Rican vote in New York. And he was also a very affable guy, you know, 
always smiling, always had a joke, always was in a good mood. And, uh, and so I think those folks early on had a, an effect on me of being a very positive, very uh, happy, keep it light guy. But when a time, when, and use that approach to tackle very difficult, serious things. Well, uh, I find it very interesting. You like to be in the, it seems like you like to be in the limelight. Being in the limelight has some very positive consequences, but also some very negative ones. Uh, have you ever lost an election? Uh, actually, my <laughs> first one, but it was one that I really wasn't trying to win. And it's interesting, my friend was, uh, Scott Randolph, had a shot to win and take back a seat from the Republicans. And so, in, but since there was only two Democrats left in Orange County, a lot of us filed in seats to make them spend money on those races. <laughs> and I actually walked for right, him. You sound like a politician. No, no, it's true. <laughs> well, I'm just telling you now. And uh, I actually walked for him during that election, mm -hmm. even though I had my own election. Right. But little did I know five months later there'd be a special, and that first election uh, helped. Um, but I can tell you, when I look at the negatives of, of, of the limelight and of dealing with all sorts of people who may not be for me, um, I view it all as if I can't handle these sort of traps along the road, then that's the end of what I do, and I accept that. A perfect example, when I get reporters interviewing mm -hmm. me who may have a, an agenda to try to look tough and, and challenge me and, and show you know the type of person they think I am, I find after talking, being a pretty moderate, pretty reasonable guy, a lot of them leave with a different objective than when they came in the room. So I believe I could change people with how I present myself. Mm -hmm. that, that's also very interesting. You're, you're, I think what you're getting at is you're describing some strategies that you use to motivate yourself right. as, as well as potentially motivate other people. Um, we do have something in, in educational psychology called the performance goal where the results you achieve are very instrumental in how you evaluate yourself as well as the goals you've set. I, I can't imagine the pressure you must be under though when you encounter someone that you can't really help. Could you describe a situation like that and how you feel and how you go about that? Well, I, for instance, if they're, I'm considered more of a moderate Democrat, so if I was dealing with a right-wing person who didn't believe in anything that I believe in, and there's plenty of them in the Florida legislature, uh, <laughs> I cut my losses quickly where I see that something's not going to be productive. Like, let's say, I remember a while back we had uh, an issue of requiring drug testing for all state employees. Even though it was unconstitutional and we had known about mm -hmm. that, I remember talking with a gentleman who actually was from the same area in New Jersey back in the day, but he came down here and, and was very right-wing, and, and, and I remember us debating, and I realized... I was never going to convince this person of what they were going to do. So I basically just cut my loss on that and knew that there was other things I could work with him on uh, and basically gave up on, on that. I changed the subject quickly to something else because, you know, you, you, there, life is too short to be wasting your time with, with, goal, with things that aren't achievable. You work on the greater things that are achievable. And, to this day, I still work with that gentleman on a couple different issues, but that one was just a, a dead end that it wasn't worth pursuing anymore. Well, uh, you're describing a situation where it sounds like you are very strategic, but I wonder when you say, you sometimes, I don't want to put words into your mouth, well, but you kind of cut your losses, you know right. when to break ties and right. move along. Um, sometimes when you're a manager, or a teacher, you're responsible for even helping the most disenchanted, apathetic individual to be engaged and to maintain their personal momentum. Do you have any? I'm sure you've encountered people well, like that. I, my thought would be, if you look at this situation, I didn't give up on the individual. I gave up on one issue to get a broader amount of other issues in return where I could still build rapport. So. Let's say if it was uh, an employee who that day blew up or, or, or said some things they regret or, or turned in something that was an error and, and you're just hitting a wall that day. Sometimes it's important 
in the long run to step back for a moment and do one of a couple of things. One, pick it up the next day if you think there's any shred of ability and potential there. Two, you can reassign them to different tasks work that exhibit their strengths rather than the one issue where there was just a roadblock on. Mm-hmm. Or three, at some point, if it's too many things, you would have to terminate that person and bring in someone who could do that job. But uh, uh, as an employer myself, I, I, on that level, I, I give people a lot of leeway. I mean, when I was describing, I was describing a representative I was working with, but as far as with my employees, I have the same folks who work for me from the first day I was in office. One of them, my head assistant, still works for me, and I've kept the same girls who work for me in the office since they've been hired. So mm-hmm. the, out of all my employees, the one with the least amount of tenure is three or four years. So, okay, yeah. well, we're back with uh, Darren Soto, state senator from District 14 in the state of Florida. And Darren, you've been talking a lot about your political career. I just wonder, and this is perhaps my personal conception, but it seems like you need to know everything. Because my perception of someone who's responsible for the legislature is you have to know about education, you have to know about funding, you have to know about social programs. You have such a large repertoire of knowledge that you need to embrace to be successful. What happens when you come up against something you know nothing about? How do you navigate that process? Through relationships and looking at someone in the legislature who I trust in that area. Uh, While we have to be a jack of all trades in the legislature, there's no doubt about it because we have to vote on almost every profession, every facet of life has some law that deals with it on the state level. And so we still specialize in the legislature. For instance, I specialize in courts issues, criminal justice issues, civil justice issues, uh, environmental issues. Um, And so people will look to me for those types of issues, civil rights issues. Uh, And there are other people, we have teachers who are in the legislature and doctors and we have uh, uh, business people. And so I try to, one of the ways I'm able to do that is first, I try to simplify everything into a couple kernels of knowledge that I could possibly understand and know. Second, I read the newspapers and internet articles constantly. Every day, I'd say at least a half an hour to an hour I'm reading. So over the course of five, six years, you know a little bit about a lot of different things, but every now and again I encounter it. And so you have to have the trust relationships in place where you could look to someone who you know is a teacher for education issues or for, as you know my wife is a public school teacher and so it goes beyond uh, the uh, just the legislators too you look to other members of your community for help and you have to quickly just like with that gentleman I talked about before you have to quickly shift over to mm-hmm. okay I don't know this but here's who I can go to find it out from uh, so I can get a real answer to be able to vote on behalf of my community you, you certainly don't sound like a guy that's easily frustrated. Not really, no. Can you give me an example of a time where you really felt like you couldn't get the job done? Well... And what you did I, about it? Well, I accept certain things to be true and then try to navigate uh, so that I could be as effective under the rule, political reality that I see at that time. For instance, right now, we're, we're in the minority in the Florida legislature. Uh, a perfect issue that we were dealing with right now, teacher bonus pay and teacher salaries. Uh, if I, I would love to get rid of a teacher bonus pay system or make it far more fair, but my peers would never be able to mm-hmm. deal with it. But there's other aspects of the issue that I could help with. Like, for instance, making sure we have a fair s- stepped program so that teachers, as they get further in, can still get a salary increase and not have it just be about bonus. So a lot of times... While I would face certain defeat with trying to deal with the bonus program, you have to find another way within the system to deal with it. Now, if we had a different governor who was in my party, we'd have the veto power, and that would mean that I'd approach in a completely different manner. If we were faced with a tough issue, I would sit there and say, you could do whatever you want today, but the man in the tower with with the Thunderbolt is going to come down and lay to waste this whole evil plot. And so the game constantly changes, and, and uh, you, 
I think I take an analysis of what the reality is and then I try to work within that reality as I understand it. Uh, if I push for things that have no shot, I've wasted time and I only have two months. So I have to make account. And so I, it's, it's really just accepting what the lay of the land is with each election, understanding what, where, the pow, where the power is, and then working with what you can do. And I don't get upset about what I can't do. Um, and, and I accept when, when things don't work out. Uh, this year's a perfect example. I had a bill that went all the way through past the House, Passed the Senate and the governor vetoed it. And it was my most important bill. It was, a bill was it was a bill that would have automatically allowed people to use their deferred action uh, designation uh, to get driver's licenses. And what I mean by that is that under the present, uh, if you uh, arrive here earlier than 16 years of age and you're attending college or you're attending the military, you could apply for deferred action status, which they will not deport you over those next two years and then you could renew and renew. Right now, you'd have to get a work permit, which could take you another year or so. And you only have a two years before your next one. You have to get a work permit before you get a license. So my bill would have said, when you get that, that acknowledgement from the federal government, you could then use that document to apply for a driver's license. Convinced Republicans 100% in the Senate. In the House, only two people voted against it. And then the governor vetoed it. But what did I do in response? We had rallies across the state, uh, in Miami, in Orlando, in Tampa. This will be, a, at, by the end of the week, the Tampa Bay Times made Rick Scott the loser of the week because that veto was so bad for him with Hispanic issues because that's a swing vote that uh, he will certainly face that issue for his reelection. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be an issue that will rise up like a phoenix to hurt him later on. And I filed the bill again this year, and we try all well, over again. It's interesting. You you sound like you're you're very enthusiastic, even though you met temporary defeat. But that sounded like it was a very uh, maybe a, a watermark moment right. in your career. And I, I when I was told that he was going to veto it, I took lemons and I tried to make lemonade. And what I did. Is and we got nationwide press. Fox News covered it nationwide. CBS covered it nationwide. And I can tell you, as a state legislature, legislator, we, we don't often get nationwide press. It's more about mm -hmm. the Congress and the U.S. Senate. And uh, so you could, even with a firm loss, I always believe there's some way you can. There are no just absolute losses in life. I just don't believe that. I believe it's you have a setback, but you could plot for something else out of it. And that's a perfect example of. My main priority being totally eviscerated, and I took it and sent a fireball back to the man who did it. And that same night, I was on the phone with um, the former Governor Charlie Crist, who will be his opponent. Shredders, I don't know how this is going to be part of the race. And so, sure. it, I don't believe there's any just dead ends where there's nothing else that you can do later on, uh, as far as in, in the political context, at least. Well, you're certainly very resilient, and uh, it seems like there's no task <laughs> that you will not uh, take on. What, what kinds of things keep you up at night? I mean, when you, uh, is there anything that bothers you? <laughs> well, I, I could say that things bother me a little bit all the time, but nothing bothers me in a big way. For instance, when I was running for the Senate, uh, that's three times the size of the district, and three times the amount of money you have to raise, three times the amount of constituents mm -hmm. that you're trying to court. And the guy who ran against me was a multi-millionaire who already had uh, name recognition across the area. He has an advertising budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And uh, and so when I woke up the day figuring, the first day of figuring out that I'm running against a multi-millionaire and I'm one of the poorest members of the Senate, just to give you an idea of where I, Half of the peer, my peers in the Senate are millionaires uh, of, of, the, of the 40 governors.